welcome to the RPG Audiobook Podcast, Cats and Kitties. My name is Ray. Uh, today I'll be reviewing a few really awesome novels that have been uh, that have been put to sound. They have been narratized by some amazing people. Uh, the narration is the most key factor because this is the audio book podcast. So just sit back. We'll be reviewing some current, up to date, modern, and possibly even classic lit RPGs. We don't know until we get inside. Dare you step into the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast Zone? Well, cats and kittens, if you weren't, you shouldn't be here. But you're listening, so I know you will. Enjoy the show. So, homebrew. Mm-hmm. Homebrew. Not something you want to drink. It was a great read, though. Metagamer Chronicles Book 1 by Xavier P. Hunter. Narrated by Michael Naramore. Oh, my gosh. You know, Mr. Naramore is one of my favorite I haven't got to hear him for a long time. Um, it is a book length of 10 hours and 3 minutes. One minute, Gary was screaming for his life, clawing at the doorframe into his own kitchen as a vortex like the intake on a jet engine tried to suck him in. The next, he was standing on a cobbled street in front of a whitewashed stone building that looked plucked from a medieval town. The sign above the door identified the place as the Uncommon Room. No way, Gary said breathlessly. This was the tavern where his players were supposed to meet. All around him, pedestrians were dressed in tunics, doublets, and tabards. Some even wore armor of various makes. Horse hooves clacked on the cobbles, and the notes of a lute rose above the general din issuing from within the tavern. Unable to resist, he pulled open the door and entered the uncommon room. Inside was a place halfway between an Irish pub and a Viking mead hall. Stone floor, exposed wooden rafters, long trestle tables with benches down the sides. So this is the kind of book that I really, really love. I mean, if you want to say to me, Ray, what's your favorite type of, you know, game lit or lit RPG story? Um, I'm going to tell you it's, it's, because I'm, I'm, I'm old school. See that beard? I'm old. I'm old school. Um, I was lit. I was RPG long before I was ever lit RPG. I, I've been doing D and D, you know, since I was a, a kid, and I love the thought of gamers, role players, LARPers, even even LARPers, falling into the game world that they are playing in. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, there's been a couple books, that, you know, like I, I enjoyed. Um, and, and these are like my favorite type of stories. Like really, really, um, these these are the ones I really just say, man, these, these are the things that bring me the meat that tastes the best. Like one of my favorite series of all time is Joel Rosenberg's Guardians of the Flame series. Um, as well as I'll even say, um, similarly is the Terry Ir- Irvin Jr.'s Triple M series, um, series um, Monsters, Maces, and Magic. Um both of which center around RPG players who get sent into a world uh, of the game they're playing. And each of them assume the role of their characters, and some live and some die, but the books are intense, and I love them. Like, there's there's Guardians of the Flame, you know, um, you, you know, you could quote someone, like, there's a guy, Walter Slavatsky, and Slavatsky has these laws that he says, and he's, uh, Slavatsky's law number two, you know, he'll say what it is. And you can live by his laws. You can very, you very easily, you know, um, you can do that. Um, and, and the heroes and characters, they act like people that are from this world going into that world. The same thing with uh, Irvin's, uh, you know, Triple M. You know, the the people there act like they would. Another case in point is Critical Failures. Um, you know, Critical Failures does a really good job um, with some humor involved, really childish, puerile uh, humor uh, of people who get thrown into a game world and act like they're they're people from this world thrown into a game world. Uh, so th- that is the, the kind of bread and butter of my, my um, you know, gaming stuff. I really love those kinds of stories. And Homebrew follows this concept a lot, but with a slight twist. Uh, the game master enters the world as himself. Yes, you know, he is himself. And all the others literally become their characters. Um, Gary, um, 
who is the game master, he remembers everything and knows he's a trespasser in the world he's in. Uh, you know, you know, the world they find himself in is the game that he designed. It's a world he pretty much homebrewed. He built it up from ground one. So, you know, he created that universe, literally. Um, and the others, they all believe they are their characters. They have no recollections of who they were in their past life. Uh, they, have, they have no knowledge of the, the other world. Um, surprisingly, though, they have bits of, of things where they filled in their character's backstory and so that became um, canon. And so, you know, you know, Gary's like, wow, you know, I remember, you know, so-and-so um, said this. And this kind of flowed into the story and, and built into it. And so um, there's a lot of stuff about this world that I really liked. It was a great concept. And, you know, just it's an interesting, fun concept. Um, but it also led the book in a path that just... Utterly weaken Gary. As the GM, Gary knows exactly what's going on and who each person is as they appear. And, and this strips him of any agency since he can't really do squat in order to help as it would alter the plans he laid out. Um, so, you know, he knows if they go down path A, they're all going to get killed. And so he kind of wants them to go down path B. And he has to do it in a very subtle, subtle way to get them to go down this way rather than that way. He knows who the killers are. He knows who the thieves are. He knows their motives. He knows everything because he designed this whole place, you, you know, f f f with other minutia. Um, and so he knows everything, but he doesn't do anything about it. Like one of the great things that they could have done um, and made a killer character would be like this omniscient observer, uh, this overseer. Um, that just kind of says, okay, gang, if we do this, this is what's going to happen, and this is how we stop him. And instead, he becomes like this milquetoast bystander most of the time, forced to slip in little hints to his friends. Um, and it was just one of those things where, again, I'm going to go back to something that Outspan Foster taught me a lot of, and that's about agency. And I've said that in another review not too long ago, that agency is key. It's a factor. I think One Arm Warlock was the, the one I was talking about. Um where, where the, the, the MC has to have agency. They have to have control of things around them, or at least a semblance of control, or the attempt to control things around them. Otherwise, if they're just being swept along by the winds of fate, it's not really exciting. It's not very interesting. And, and it kind of takes away everything about the story. And that's what I have the issue with Gary. Um, Gary could have done a lot, a lot, um, and it could have been like this really intense storyline, um, you know, with Gary knowing things. And then like the best part would have been like when it got to some point where he didn't know what was going to happen next. And then he'd be like, oh, crap, I have no clue who these people are, where they came from. What are we going to do now? And that, that doesn't happen because he kind of just says, OK, this is how we have to do it. I have to play it this way. I have to do that. Um, and it just kind of takes away everything that you, you would want from your MC. And it, it, I know it annoyed me a lot, um, in spite of the fact that I enjoyed the book. I mean, like, I, literally, um, I, I sat there and was like, this is this this could be, like, one of the best books ever for me. Um, but, but, it, there, there was just so many things. I, I Just Gary was shackled, shackled most of the book. No, no, for the entirety of the book. He's shackled. Um, the characters have a lot of depth, and each situation carries a little weight in numerous ways, but the MC is shackled. Um, and, and, you know, that's the bad thing. This is the kind of a book that, that has a style that I relish. Hunter does a great job with it. Um, Michael Nairmore, uh, he's a narrator I haven't heard in a long time. It's been about two years since I listened to a book of his, and I have missed him so much. Um, he does an incredible job here. I know, know him from, like, Kevin Hardman's superhero series. And if you get a chance and you like superheroes, Check out the stuff by Hardman. I mean, it's really good. And, and you know, and they're more like he's a five star narrator in a four star world. The dude is amazing. And overall, I, I love the book. It has a great narrator and some wonderful storytelling going on, but the lack of agency just smothered me a lot. Uh, in fact, I, I docked a few points off because of that. Um, it would have been a completely different book if his reins had been taken off. But that's that's really all I could think of was like, you know, he just he's shackled and he's, he's just not doing everything the way that it should have been to make it really incredible. Um, so I'm giving it a 7.6 stars, which is 
my way of saying, man, the, the narration is really great. So if you're coming here for narrators and want to know if this, the book has a good narrator, yeah, Naramore is fantastic. I, you know, I think he has, um, what was it, the, the Outlaw book, which is like 76 hours. I think he was the one that did that. I can't think of right off the top of my head if that was it. But he, he kept me enthralled for a long time. Um, Naramore is a fantastic um, the, the, the characters are interesting. The world is interesting. You know, he gets to meet gods that he created. Um, and it's it's really neat. It's this really great concept. But it just kind of just add a little bit, like, you know, you're walking down the hall and you step on a Lego and you stub your toe and then you trip over the cat all at once. Um, just because the, the MC just did not have the, the agency or the power or the, whatever the wherewithal to do things that he should. Um, and it kind of took away a lot from me. So, you know, like say 7.6 stars, it's not a bad book, but it needed something different um, for me to enjoy it more. Uh, so I'm not taking away from the, from the narration. The narration actually brought this up. I would have, I would have given this a much higher score, even in the upper eights um, for the narration and this, the, the idea, the concept, but the, the lack of agency for me was just a key factor. So if you, you, you know, you, you're worried about the narration, don't be. It's fantastic. It is not the narrator. Um, this is basically, just like I say, um, the, the lack of agency. And even then, I, I, I'm only taking off four points uh, because I enjoyed the book otherwise a lot more than I thought I would. You know, the way it was going, I was like, man, I don't know if I can handle this. But the book is good. It's darn good. So 7.6 stars, check it out. So this book is Shattered Sword, Eternal Online Book One by T.J. Reynolds, narrated by Andrea Parsnow. It has a book length of 13 hours and nine minutes. Fiery flesh biscuits. I don't care how fancy your hair is, a sword that long just wouldn't work. My body was surging with righteous gamer anger. And this was my day off? I'd silenced my inbox, taken a break from the endless job hunt, and tried to find a bit of peace destroying the enemies of Gaia. I hadn't finished Final Fantasy VII in years, and I wanted to see if I could beat it at level 50. I'd done everything right. Something was off. I launched a quick search. FF7 Sephiroth Final Battle. I read the first walkthrough I found. I had slain the bare-chested angel's first two forms. The last was supposed to be scripted. I clicked Omni-Slash, but Sephiroth had dodged my blow and killed me with his ridiculous sword. There was only one explanation. Someone had hacked the file I was playing. Okay, so Shattered Sun is its an interesting book in which a young girl kind of inherits her father's debt, and in order to avoid becoming an indentured servant... She joins into a game uh, using the last of her monies uh, in the hopes of earning enough money to stab off the collectors. Um, now, there, there are several things that kind of struck me as odd. First, once in the game, she really doesn't do a lot to earn cash, which is weird. Uh, you know, if that's your goal, that should be the primary goal. And then suddenly she kind of gets everything she needs. It just seemed like... Um, what should have been a driving force throughout the book wasn't really there. Secondly, and this was my biggest conundrum, was that when she entered the game, she brought her only family heirloom, an ancient sword, with her. Um, yeah, you, you could like literally scan in stuff and say, this is like the one thing I want to bring into the game. Um, so you can bring in real world, item, real world items um, as long as they fit the game's theme. And the sword did, thankfully. Now, for some reason, the game considers the family weapon to be some sort of super-powered OP item of mass destruction and shatters the sword, hence the title, um, into several pieces that the girl has to collect in order to find it before she's able to use it properly. You know, she's got a piece to start off with, um, but if she uses it, it's really dangerous to her. It will be deleterious to her health. Um, so she really has to kind of piece things together as she goes along. Now, this would make you think the series is going to be about Dahlia, not the MC, searching for, you know, coin that can be used IRL and collecting pieces of the sword. Basically, 
I'm going to look for parts of the sword and earn money while I do so. And that's really not what the book is about. Um, the weapon issue is that Dahlia starts off with one piece of the sword and can use it, just not safely or effectively. Then she sort of kind of stumbles along across into a couple other pieces, but not because she's actively looking. And it was just kind of weird. And again, this is just me giving you like my synopsis of the story. The story is really good, and I enjoyed this a lot. Um, it is a good tale. Um, and I, like you say, as harsh as I make it sound, I, I love this book. Dahlia was interesting. The world was vibrant. The emotions were genuine. Um, you have a 16-year-old trying not to become a slave, finds herself in a hostile land without the one weapon she was counting on using. Um, and she's not a Mary Sue who can defeat all comers. She's scared. She's shy. She struggles. This is what makes the book. Okay, so when I'm going through this and saying, you know, here's where I was kind of surprised or, you know, this happened, like, literally... The only thing I really can complain about was I would have thought like as the book, as the, the, the character progressed, as the book went on, that Dahlia would have done a lot more active hunting for ways to earn money. Like just been like, like if it was me and I, like, I don't want to become an indentured servant, my buttocks is like mowing down monsters and looking for the magic item that I can sell online to make the moolah. I mean, that's just it, period. That's just the way it works. Um, and that really was not in her head. So, I mean, she's not what you call um, a forward thinker in the respect that um, she realizes that her life is on the line, almost literally. Uh, and she's not doing what she should be. She's doing everything but most of the time. Um, but I get it. You're in another world. And, you know, it's it's neat. It's new. It's scary. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, and, you know, I, I know that I talked to, to somebody else, and I won't, I won't say who, but they were kind of like... Um, she seemed to be scared a lot. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, first off, I can get that. Um, she's 16, and she's got a whole weight of the world. She's lost her father. She's going to lose her home. She's going to lose her her freedom. Um, she should be terrified. Um, and, you know, and, and going out and to face things that are, you know, possibly going to destroy her and set her back. Um, and her plans, even more, is kind of crazy. Um, but... That's what made the book so 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 enjoyable was you know seeing her struggle, seeing her work to get ahead um, as a gamer rather than just it's all about the money. But it just it's one of those things where I say that the money thing should have been more of a factor, and it was kind of like almost a secondary thought. Like, oh yeah, I better put this in here where she's got enough money to make it for the month or for whatever, um, you know, so that she's not you know kicked out of the game and and, and all this. And so it kind of happens. And I'm not trying to give spoilers, but that's a major point for me. Um, so, you know, as I go through this, you know, I try to say, here's where I, I, I just kind of stumble a little bit on things. And that was it. That was like my big, big picking point. So anyway, uh, let's talk about the really good stuff. Andrea Parsnow, she narrates and does an amazing, incredible job as usual. But I have to say, and I, I hate to say this. There is one character who has what I'm assuming to be a Spanish accent uh, that didn't seem to fit her as well as her other voices. Um, she didn't do a bad job. Andrea always does a killer job, but just to me, this is sort of like trying to believe, like, you know, like Al Pacino was a Colombian from Scarface. Great performance, odd accent. It just, it it was, it was nearly there, um, but it wasn't quite. And I don't know if she was kind of trying to hold back, so it wasn't like a, a thick accent. But um, it just it just almost worked, but didn't click for me as well. And you know, I'm surprised because Andrea always, always throws in like amazing stuff, and then she kills in this book, totally kills. Um, but that one that one character, it just it just didn't really ever feel natural to me. Like I don't know if she had a hard time with it, uh, and if so, she really rose to the occasion because you know she. It's kind of like me doing a. a and I'm not even going to try it, like doing a Spanish accent um, and hearing it come out of my mouth. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that I know that that's not good. But it's it's for me, that's the best I can get. Um, but hearing her do that, and I know she, she's doing as well as she can. Um, and it just doesn't quite ring true. And I, and I think it just needs a little bit more work and it would be there. Um, but if I did it, it would just never make it. Like There's just no way. Um, you know, because I'd be like doing Pacino, you know, you know, you know, like that. That's how it would sound, um, you know, and, and it's just not right. And, and again, it, just trying to keep it where it's, it's it's correct sounding 
and working, but it just it just didn't fly for me as well as the other voices. And you know, like, sorry, Hans, I mean, like I said, I, I got a call, uh, call it like I hear them, you know. And and the rest of her performance is spot on. She brings this book to life. Um, but it was just funny because I was like, man, I can't wait to hear you know what Andrea does this time because every single book I get, she does something new, she does something innovative, she is always improving. And like I say. I'm not even saying she did a bad job with the accent. It just didn't seem to me like it was like as as perfect as I expect. Is that is that a good way to do it? Um, it just didn't didn't make me go, man. She just nailed that one too. It was kind of like you know she did the accent. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. Uh, the book is really good. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, and Andrea does a fantastic job. I'm just picking on her a little bit. I mean, it's not like Dookie ever came up. Um, but anyway, final score is 8.2 stars. Uh, between TJ's writing and Andrea's narration, this was a great book. Um, I really look forward to book two, uh, so hopefully that will happen. Um, I, I can get my hands on that one. Until then, go out and get this book. You'll really like it, I think. Okay, folks, well, it's getting a little late in the day um, around here, and so I am going to uh, do Irrelevant Jack 2. By Prax Venter before it gets too dark for me to record because I don't want to do another episode where it was uh, me just getting moved into the house and you couldn't see anything behind me except for the spooky shadows. Um, Irrelevant Jack 2 is narrated by Justin Thomas James, Jeff Hayes, Andrea Parsnow, and even there's some talking by Prax Venter. Um, it's got a book length of 11 hours and 33 minutes. They both nodded and Jack sent them up to the next floor. After the pure white everything washed from his senses, he found himself under clear blue skies and warm, soupy air. All around them were rusted cars, but they had a strange, cube-like design. Jack placed the floor two layout as an abandoned scrapyard. Everything appeared to have sat outside in this heat and humidity for many years. Heaping piles of wreckage circled a central area where grassy trails curved outward between the automotive garbage. Bright orange rust clashed pleasantly with the lush green grass covering the ground and the rich blue sky above. Behind them, the exit orb pulsed faintly, poking up through the trunk of a compressed vehicle. Jack rocked side to side on his feet, feeling the soft blades of grass under his boots. He'd fallen into a habit of acclimating himself to the footing on a new floor the moment he entered. Venter returns to the corruption of the tower. Sort of sounds like a Stephen King book, doesn't it? You know, like there's this dark tower and there's this corruption that's destroying the rest of the world, the real world, the world that we live in and that... Uh, the character kind of fell into sort of sounds like that. I'm not making comparisons at all. I'm not saying anything negative about that um, because everybody knows I, I am not um, a huge Stephen King fan by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so I don't want you to feel like I'm picking on uh, Prax, you know, uh, Vendor at all. I'm just making a joke. Um, it, but he pretty much picks up the second book, book two, which follows book one right where we left off in the first book for the most part. Um, this time we continue to follow Jack and his companions, um, Art and Lex. Um, the book follows a fairly simple pattern of tower climbing and then town development. So you may view it as being a bit repetitive, you know, like wash, rinse, repeat, that sort of thing. But it's not so bad. Um, it's just a pattern and a rhythm that, you know, that, that, that Prax kind of has. And it works. I mean, it really does. I, you know, I was thinking about it and I was like, you know, um, it kind of had to be into that because he has to go in, he has to have things happen, then he has to get out and then have things happen, and then he's got to go up and, and so on and so forth. And so um, it, it really is just kind of him kind of setting a tone and the pace to the book uh, because the corruption can only be battled in the tower and so on and so forth. So the only way that things can change is in the tower. So he's got to go into the tower and he's got to come out and he's got to build up the town. So, it, you know, you may view it as being like, okay, wash, rinse, repeat cycle. Not the case. This is how it has to work. Now, he may change it up a little bit later and do things where, like, you know, he can change something so the town is actually aggressively attacking the corruption, too. I don't know. I haven't read book three, um, but you see where I'm going with this. 
Now, Jack does get a new partner to kind of hang out with in a tower along with his other, uh, and that is the crux of the book. As Jack struggles to find the corruption, he climbs the tower and rebuilds the town. Um, fans of either subgenre, like tower climbing or town building, will really enjoy this book. And, and I happen to be a fan of both, and honestly, um, I didn't think that I would enjoy tower climbing when towers, tower books first started coming out, the subgenre of build, you know, climb the tower and, and defeat everything. It was kind of like it's it's just it's kind of silly because it's just like a dungeon in reverse. Instead of going you know down, you're going up, and you know as you go down or you go up, it gets harder and harder. So either way, you know the further you are from the baseline of ground level, the tougher it gets. Uh, up or down doesn't make a difference. So dungeon crawl is a tower or climb in reverse, or vice versa, and. So I didn't think I would like them as much because it just kind of seemed like they were just flipping things around. But tower climbs actually have a bit of a kick to them that, you know, you don't get from a dungeon crawl. It sounds it sounds a little silly like that when I say it, but it's the truth. And so, you know, um, I do like that a lot. The tower climbing aspects are done really well here. Um, I also enjoy the town building stuff. Like, I, I, that's another thing. Like, it seemed really silly to me. Like, okay, we're going to do this. But then I go back to, like, when I first started playing... Um, the first World of Warcraft. The first World of Warcraft was basically just you building a village up and then making it bigger and tougher and stronger. You go out and you cut down wood or you do whatever, you gather rocks, and, and you build up the thing and, and you fight off enemies as they come. Um, and I like that aspect. Like, it's really fun. Like, it's one of the best parts of Life Reset is the tower, not the tower, the, 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 the town building that goes on. And so if you like, you know, like Life Reset, you will love irrelevant jack because it's got the kind of the same rhythm to it as he's got to put this in and put that in and he's got to do this and that and so you know it's it's a fun little change up with the genre where he's doing two things i enjoy it and you know just as it just it, what it is it is um the only downside that i could really if i had a nitpick i'm not a nitpicker most of the time but if i've got a nitpick um was the lack of growth in spite of Jack's progression and leveling. Now, Jack does start to, to level a bit more, um, but the, the book was fun enough that I could overlook stuff like, you know, the, the wash and repeat parts. Um, but, you know, I would have liked to see Jack do a little changing, a little growing. That's like the whole point of reading a book is, you know, and that's like, if I'm going to pick a movie out, I'll pick a great movie that I can really ex give you an example. Um, Marvel's Captain Marvel which I hate that because Captain Marvel is a DC character who says the word Shazam and he turns into this big red cheese uh, and it will always be Captain Marvel to me. But Marvel robbed him of that title back in 1972. And so I will now say, you know, Captain Marvel it, grudgingly is a Marvel character. Either way, in the movie Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers starts off as Carol Danvers and she ends as Carol Danvers. She has literally no growth. She doesn't change. And I'm not beating it down because I don't like that book. Like, I've been a Carol Danvers fan. I have a complete run of Miss Marvel. I have the X-Men episodes where um, Carol goes into space. Or not episodes. I have the, the books where she goes into space and becomes binary. Then I have the, the books where she comes back and she becomes, you know, she's Warbird. And I, so you name it, I have those books. Um, and, uh, you know, so when I say this, I'm literally just pointing out um, as character, there's no change. Like, Carol starts off in this point, and she ends here, the exact same character. She has no suffering, there's there's no pain, there's no agony, no struggle. It's just, she just kind of goes through the story. And and that kind of, like, aside from, like, the, the leveling parts, didn't seem like Jack did a lot of change. And I like to see a little bit of change in characters as we go through it. But again, picking at nits. Now, you know, just, you know, I think one of my favorite parts of the book, though, was the growth of the burgeoning romance between Jack and Lex. Um, you know, Venter is kind of known for his saucier writings. And here it was, you know, he likes it spicy, uh, like Scoval units to the sky, kind of spicy. Um, it was nice to see him stretch love muscles. <laughs> Not those kind of love muscles, love muscles in other directions. Um, you know, like actual love, like, you know, emotional love. Um, he was flexing that muscle rather than the physical kind. Um, and, and so, you know, it was good to see that, too. Um, I think it worked really well. And I, I'm, that is a growth for for him. I, you know, not that I'm saying he couldn't have done it before, but it's good to see that take place. Like, you know, he could have been in a naughty episode way back when. And this one here is kind of a nice episode. So in and, and this narration, 
it, it really gets you to appreciate the story. The narration is just superb. SBT, I will always say, has continued their level of excellence with the ever-amazing Justin Thomas James. Brother! You know, I, I say that because one of my favorite characters is this big flying monkey that goes around yelling, Brother! That Justin t uh, narrates, he speaks, and it just kills me. And so I have to just shout out to Justin Thomas James every time I, I say his name. i got to go, Brother! Uh, but anyway, JTJ absolutely smashes his way through this tale. His voice has a real gravity and a sincerity that you don't find in a lot of, um, I don't want to say it like this, but male uh, narrators, you know, most of them just kind of tell the story. His kind of has like, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to say Darth Vader kind of depth because he's not from the dark side, but you know, you, you hear him and you're like, oh, J.T. James. It's kind of like, you know, um, smooth, sincere. He's got weight. And when he reads reads it, if you ever like get to watch like him do like SBT stuff on stage, like when they were out and they were doing like uh, the award show, he's like so laid back and cool, and that comes across like he's just laid back. He's just telling the story, but he tells it really amazingly well. You can't tell that he's just kind of loafing around in his boxers. Probably, um, he's 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 really telling the story. Um, you can feel his emotions come out towards Lex. Um, you know, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, Plus, his voice is like music to your ear holes. Uh, to quote uh, Scott Pilgrim's lines, it is music to your ear holes, literally. Jeff Hayes bats clean up and continues to play uh, background support without attempting to outshadow his main narrator, and, and Andrea Parsno um, lends her melodious voice to the character of Lex, and she plays well off of JTJ. Um, I wouldn't complain if she had more airtime. Um, Andrea is just playing awesome. Um, and, and here, you know, like I say, I, I say Jeff bats clean up because, you know, he plays really essential small roles. He's like the the, the character uh, actor, you know, so to speak. Um, you know, he, he's leading man material, too, but he, he kind of insinuates himself into the background of stories most times with SBT uh, where he should be, you know, the lead person. But here, you know, like I say, JTJ, just perfect. Um, so I can't complain. Um, but like I said, with Andrea, I wish she had more airtime too. Uh, it's just finally nice to hear what Prax sounds like. Uh, he does make an appearance. And so that was fun and exciting. Uh, just kind of hear him as it, you know, as it goes. Um, overall, the book has maintained its quality and pushes the plot line ahead nicely. I look forward to book three, but it really kind of just maintained its level of awesomeness. It didn't kind of shoot up words or go down words. So it was a flat eight stars for me. Not a bad book. But it just kind of just said, okay, we're coasting right through this. And then not in a bad way, I say coasting. I mean, they just kind of forged ahead. They maintained. That's hard to do. And I give Prax credit. Irrelevant Jack is fun. Pick it up. Dig it. Pricked babies. Well, everybody, believe it or not, that is the end of the show. Again, I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. I just want to say I totally appreciate everything you guys do, taking the time to listen, to watch me. Um, if you want to support the show, always like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page. Or just like and share this video. Gosh darn it. Gosh darn it. Gosh darn it. I can't talk no more. Anyway, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show. Please leave your comments or suggestions below, and feel free to tell me whatever you like. I enjoy, believe it or not, the feedback, good and bad. Uh, you can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Um, so remember, I do have a novel out. It's called Nightmare Game System, NGS, uh, Horror Lit RPG. You might enjoy it. Give it a shot. I would appreciate it. And please, as always, leave a review for any book that you've listened to or read. Authors really depend on these reviews. For the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening. <laughs>